we've been socked in all day. It's been drizzly and dark and gloomy and just all around ugly. Um, it's finally starting to break a bit, but I don't think it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna break fully. I think clouds are rolling right back in to fill in the gaps. So, you know, makes for a good temperature. It's been a nice temperature all weekend, but sucks for photography, which really sucks for me because I've been itching to take photos with my one of my analog cameras for like weeks now and I need it man I need it need that injected into my blood um so I was hoping to go out today but it, it's just the weather so ugly there was nothing I wanted to photograph under it but rather than waste the whole day I decided that I'm gonna get some scouting done I'm gonna check out some locations that were maybe on the list and I was on my way to visit a location that a viewer actually recommended uh, over in Anaheim and on my way to the location I passed a scene that um I nearly broke my freaking neck snapping it around to, to look at this scene that caught my eye because uh, it really caught my eye. And um, so I circled back and came to that location. And uh, this scene I actually think could work with a stormy overcast sky. I think actually that may be the best take on this scene. So uh, I'm going to try and go out and photograph that tonight. Now to take this photo I have to stand in the center divider of a pretty busy road which uh, I hate doing because it, it just attracts a lot of attention. It opens the door for heckling and honking and questioning. Um, so in these scenarios, there's a certain technique I like to utilize to help fly under the radar. I think you know where this is going. So the vest is my urban camo. Just blend right into the landscape. People think I'm working on the center divider or something. As for the toothpick, um, I don't know, man. Something about a toothpick in my mouth just makes me feel confident. Like I can really tell someone to leave me alone with gusto as long as I got a toothpick in my mouth. Like clearly I'm working. I have a toothpick in my mouth. Sir, sir, I'm gonna need you to move along, leave me alone. Very important business. Old timey camera, center divider, building. Clearly, very important work. You leave, sir, thank you, ma'am, sir, ma'am. Please lower your voice, ma'am. Sir, 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 sir. Go ahead, call the police. I'll call them, okay? You know what, I'll call them right now. Yeah, confidence. It's the confidence toothpick. I feel like Clint Eastwood with this toothpick. Why don't you show me what you can do? Escape from Alcatraz. Great flick, great flick. Underrated, underrated Clint Eastwood movie. Well, that's one thing I didn't anticipate. There's a car parked in front of it. Earlier, the parking lot was completely empty. This place is closed. Why is there a car parked there? Really don't want a car parked there. Yeah, it wouldn't be a Nick Carver video if the first attempt didn't fail. Guess I'll load up some film just in case that car leaves. The lights turn on. We're doing Portra 400. We normally do 160, but a little higher ISO is going to help in this super dim light. So now we wait. Pretty much every other store around here, their signage is already turned on. And Firestone still isn't. So that's not promising. If everything doesn't work out within the next 10 minutes, I think we're SOL. You see, I want that to look like that. That's a pretty freaking cool sign. I bet the building's not worth shooting. <sighs> Why can't it ever just go perfectly according to plan?
All right, so I have an update and uh, a little bit of bad news in regards to taking this photo. So I went back to the location a second time, uh, the following day, which is Monday, uh, in the hopes that the signage would turn on then, because after all, maybe it just didn't turn on on Sunday. They're closed on Sunday, so why would they turn on the lights? So coming back Monday, I was hoping with them being open, the lights would turn on. And, um, you know, when I showed up, right off the bat, I knew I wasn't going to be taking pictures because there were some cars in the parking lot that I didn't really like their arrangement and I didn't really like the look of the cars. So um, I knew I wasn't going to be taking any exposures. But I wanted to stick around to find out if the lights turn on because then I can learn something about it and then maybe just come back the following Monday. Um, now, there were some fluorescent lights on the front of the building that were on, uh, which is good news because that's better than nothing but also a darkened parking lot with just a row of fluorescent lights can look really cool. So that was encouraging. However, the neon signs, the Firestone signs, the signage I'm really there to photograph, never turned on. Um, and so with another failed attempt behind me, I started to hypothesize that maybe that signage never turns on at all during the summer because the business closes two to three hours before the sun even sets. So why would they turn on their signage if they're closed three hours before darkness falls? And so with that in mind, I decided to do something that I never really do, which is I decided to contact the business. Mitchell Tire Service. Um, I sent him an email and I said, I have two odd questions for the owner of Mitchell Tire Service. First, I would like to know if and when the exterior neon signs on your building turn on. Second, I would like to know if you'd be, be okay with me photographing the building at some point. I'd be happy to provide you with the both digital and printed copies of the photo. I'm an architectural photographer, blah, blah, blah. Um, just laying out that I like taking pictures of really cool buildings. Their building's really cool. Would it be all right if I took a photo? But I really need to know when the neon signs turn on. So I got a reply, a uh, very nice gentleman named Dave, uh, short and to the point. You are more than welcome to take pictures. At the present time, the sign is out. Sorry. So good enough for me. Uh, I got my answer. I'm not going to waste time jotting out there every evening to see if the, the signs ever turn on. But now I have a little bit of a dilemma. Do I still want to execute this photo? And um, my general philosophy on this kind of stuff is, yeah, still go take it. Um, it may not be exactly what you wanted it to be, but you've already worked it up in your brain. You better get it out of your brain before you move on to something else. And so we're still going to attempt it. And now uh, I'm just going to try and catch it when the uh, fluorescent lights are on and there's a good arrangement of cars in the parking lot or no cars at all. Uh, it's still the same composition. I want the lighting to be a little different now though. I originally wanted cloudy, but now since I'm only gonna have that fluorescent row of lights to work with, I don't want it to be so dark and gloomy. Um, so the weather's clear today. I'm gonna give it a go. Um, hopefully, hopefully there's no cars that um, make me not wanna take the picture. How can... If you ever wonder why I don't do more on location videos... Yeah. Not only is that ugly ass car still in the exact same spot, taking up way too much attention in the very front of the composition, but now there's a bunch of freaking cones everywhere! With string and little fl flutteries on it! Maybe they're repaving soon? Oh, my God. Well, I guess I'll be coming back one or two or ten more times. Jesus. You know, I get kind of torn on uh, situations like this where it's just getting harder and harder to execute the photo that I originally envisioned. And there's all these you know, different elements out of my control that are working against me. Um, on the one hand, I'm extremely discouraged and I want to just give up. But on the other hand, I kind of get more stubborn about it. Like, you're not going to talk me out of this one, universe. Oh, you bet your ass I'm taking this photo. But we'll see. If I have to come back like three or four more times, I might just ditch it. I just really hope the final picture is worth it. It's 
So we're in the car again, except this time it's uh, four in the morning. So that's fun. Um, I've uh, been back to the location three times just since I last saw you. Uh, so that puts us at like seven attempts uh, since this whole thing began. Yesterday I thought maybe I should uh, try shooting it at dawn instead of dusk. Because so I thought maybe, you know, if I switch up my approach a little bit, the photography gods will give me a freaking break! And let this thing actually happen. And uh, at some point over the seven attempts, I had a wacky idea. And uh, we're going to try something new this morning. Yeah, Sin is still 800T. Uh, I've never shot this film before, so I figured this would be a perfect opportunity to see what all the hubbub's about. Um, it's a very expensive film though, so I hope I don't screw anything up. My biggest concern is that uh, I'm shooting a tire shop, not a gas station at night. And I'm not actually sure that this film works on anything other than gas stations at night. But it doesn't see anything on the box, so I think we'll be all right. We'll see. Boy, that street light's gonna be trouble. Flare galore. By scouting this scene so thoroughly in advance, I knew exactly where I was gonna stand, and I knew what lens I was gonna use, which was the Rodenstock 115 millimeter. It's a lens I find myself using more than any other on 6x17, at least in these types of photos. It's a very useful focal length in this format. Currently have an hour before sunrise. This will be about 15 minutes before I start shooting. And it's this dark out, it's so hard to see the ground glass that sometimes referring to the original scouting shot on my phone helps me find reference points that I can barely make out. On the ground glass. Let's see. I think maybe I'm too far to the right. Let's see. So I think the biggest appeal to Cinestill film is the halos it creates around uh, points of light. Uh, it's called halation. And um, that's a symptom of it being a cinema film in which they've removed the REM jet layer. So on cinema film, there's a REM jet layer, which is a, a jet black back layer, uh, which is an anti-static and uh, anti-scratch and anti-halation layer. But they have to remove that uh, to create cinestill film. And uh, removing that results in halation. That halation effect can be a little gimmicky, and I'm hoping it's not gonna make this shot look too... I hope this shot isn't gonna be all about the halation around the lights. That's not my goal. Um, but, you know, Cinestill film can look pretty cool that way, so... Um, maybe it'll be awesome, maybe it'll be distracting. I don't know. All right, the morning light is just starting to break through, so I need to be ready. I think I paid $14 for this roll of film. No, thir $13? 
comes out to like $3.25, $3.50 per picture, not counting processing. So I'm not going to be bracketing a whole lot. One of the difficult things about this film is there's like no reciprocity data on it because it's a cinema film. You'd never encounter reciprocity uh, shooting in a movie camera. So if I do encounter that, I'm going to have to kind of guess. It's still so dark out. Okay, two. I'm going to do F16 and two thirds at three seconds. The metered is two seconds, but I'm going to do three. So I think it might be about right for reciprocity. I'm so concerned about the flare on this street light. Using the dark slide here to try and block that street light. Okay, here goes. One, two, three. Oh boy. I can hear the cash register changing every time I take an exposure. So definitely a little early here on the lighting. It's not quite prime light just yet, but that's par for the course on these. I always photograph a little before prime light all the way through to past prime light, kind of bookending the ideal ratio between ambient light and artificial light. But all that being said, I was quite relieved to see this exposure for a couple reasons. First off, I'm beyond happy to see that the dark slide flare blocker didn't creep into the shot and block the Firestone sign. That's actually the number one thing I was worried about in getting the film back, but no problem there. And secondly, it seems my estimated reciprocity adjustment was spot on because the exposure is spot on. So that was lucky on my part. Now you can see the halation very clearly here. It's that kind of red glow around all the fluorescent lighting, and that gives it that classic Cinestill look. So with my first exposure or two down, it's just a matter of waiting for the ambient light to get into that prime balance. Can you imagine how rad these neon signs must have been when they were working? And glorious. Oh yeah, now the sky's perfect. Right at the EV I want it to be. Okay, so. Okay. Two thirds, two seconds, so we're gonna do three seconds. Beautiful sky, man. I'm so happy about it. Cool exhaust, bro. Definitely not freaking annoying. Everyone thinks you're so cool. That's too. I can't believe it's happening. I can't believe I am actually, I'm actually making exposures. This is more what I had in mind. This exposure hit the perfect timing in terms of a balance between artificial and ambient light. Now, as far as metering goes, I ended up not bracketing at all on this entire roll. So all four exposures had the same exposure settings. And the way I got those settings is how I meter all of these types of scenes, which is 
I got my meter reading off of the artificially lit areas first before the ambient light got to where I wanted it to. Then I simply checked the sky every so often, every minute or so, until I got an EV reading that lined up the meter where I wanted it to be. So in other words, I locked in my exposure settings off of the artificial light and then checked the ambient light again and again until the ambient light fell into the range that I wanted it to be. For those of you who have done my metering course, I got my initial EV reading off of the wall and off of the interior space in the office and made sure those lined up real high on the scale on the positive side. And then I checked my EV reading off of the sky every so often until that EV reading lined up at minus two thirds because that was my goal for the sky. But technical jargon aside, let's talk about the image itself. I don't know what it is exactly about these types of scenes that attract me so strongly. I guess I'm just really interested in little vignettes like this that kind of capture modern society and day-to-day mundane human activity without showing any of the people involved in it. It's almost like I'm an archaeologist studying 21st century American culture, but I'm a thousand years in the future and I don't have anyone around to actually ask them about it. But by looking at a scene like this, I can gather a lot of information about what went on. Whether it's the signs plastered in the windows, the bulletin board full of business cards in the lobby, the busted up neon sign on the building, the stack of tires out front, all the way down to the garbage in the parking lot. They're all telling some part of a much larger story of what goes on at this location day in, day out for many, many years. It's just a snapshot of America 2021. Or maybe it's just a dumb hipster photo of a tire repair shop. I guess it depends on who you ask. Okay, that's my, the end of my first roll of Cine still. Aww, an exciting day for me. All right, do I want to bang out a roll of Portra? I think I do. Gotta load quick. What I understand, Cinestill actually is Kodak film. Kodak, like Vision 3 or something, I think it's called. Uh, so this will be a little bit of a Kodak versus Kodak situation. Okay. Don't forget to change the ISO on the meter. That's something I would do. Okay. Uh, la, 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 la. Yeah, 16, 2, 3, 4 seconds. 4 seconds on Portra. Ah, ah, ah. No, wrong app. La, 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 la. Six seconds. Okay. Here we go. This won't be a direct comparison because the light has advanced a little bit, but here we go. This version on Portra looks different from the Cinestill version in about all the ways that one would expect. First off, there is no halation around the lights. No surprise there. It's also finer grain. And again, that's no surprise because it's a lower ISO film and Portra happens to be a particularly fine grain film. But most noticeably, to me at least, is the Portra version is much warmer overall. And this is what I expected, given the fact that Portra is not a dedicated tungsten-balanced film like Cinestill is. So the warm tones of artificial lighting, like the fluorescent lights under the overhang, will come through much warmer than they do on Cinestill. Now, as I record this, I really can't decide which one I like more. I'm split right down the middle, 50-50. But I'm sure much of my attraction to the Portra version is just familiarity. I really only shoot Portra at dawn and dusk. And so I'm familiar with the color palette. I'm familiar with how it responds to artificial light and dawn or dusk light. So I'm just used to the way it looks. And so that version right now to me feels more comfortable. It also syncs up with the rest of my portfolio more easily. But the Cinestill version grows on me more and more every time I see it. I can say this for sure. This won't be the last time I shoot Cinestill. It's a damn fun film. And that is a wrap. Cow, what a productive morning. 
I tried a new film. I finally took this photo after endless attempts. It feels so good. And I'm gonna go home and go back to sleep. <laughs>